Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and very warm welcome to Friday Frightworks, and this week, Gibson's Flightless Phoenix, the Firebird. <laughs> I rewind to 2005 and my life was irrevocably changed when my old man bought the old Grey Whistle Test box set DVD collection. I not long started playing guitar at that point and as much as I'd been voraciously devouring my dad's record collection, those DVDs introduced me to a world of artists and bands and musicians that crucially not only had I not heard but had never actually seen before. And it really did change my life and introduced me to no end of my musical heroes and influences. Elton John, John Martin, Little Feet, the New York Dolls, Tom Waits. Focus, John Otway and Wild Willie Barrett. Definitely one that will live long in the memory, but crucially, both Alan Collins' solo on Leonard Skinner's Freebird and Johnny Winter playing Jumpin' Jack Flash really did leave an indelible impression. Largely because, not only the guitar playing, but the fact that they were both playing Firebirds. A guitar that at the time, comparative to my own Squire Affinity Telecaster, a guitar that I loved and still love to this day, the Firebird just looked absolutely mental. Long protruding horns and tremolo and a long pointy swooping curved headstock. Much like Roxy Music and Phil Manzanera actually. It looked like something that had arrived from outer space and I was absolutely hooked. And thus it is of still some mystery to me why fast forward the better part of 18 years and it's only really now that I'm rediscovering my love for the Firebird. Better late than never, I suppose. Introduced in 1963, largely in response to Gibson losing ground to Fender, the new Californian upstarts. That's a very common theme for Gibson throughout the 50s and 60s, and you can pretty much trace any Gibson solid body design in this era to them chasing Fender. The Firebird undoubtedly paid homage to an earlier Gibson design in the Explorer, which was so wildly unsuccessful in its time that it's estimated that only 22 were actually made. Thankfully, the Firebird didn't suffer quite the same fate. Designed by famed coach builder Ray Dietrich, after a chance meeting between him and Ted McCarty, Ray having recently retired to Kalamazoo, Michigan, of course, where Gibson were based, and Ted seeing him give a talk on his life in car design, the Firebird was introduced in four increasingly well-appointed guises, the 1, the 3, the 5, and the 7. The Firebird 1, retailing at $189.50, came with a single pickup, an unbound fingerboard, wrapper with tailpiece, enclosed banjo-style tuners, and dot inlays. Meanwhile, the Firebird 3, retailing at $249.50, came with two pickups, a bound fingerboard, and a Gibson Vibrola. The Firebird 5, retailing at $325, came with a tunematic bridge and a deluxe Vibrola, as well as Gibson's usual trapezoid pearl inlays, while the 7, then Gibson's most expensive solid body guitar, retailed at $445, coming with an ebony fingerboard, gold-plated hardware, and three pickups, with the accompanying case setting you about $46, which means that a Firebird 7 with case in today's money would set you back roughly $5,000. As many people have pointed out over the years, Gibson guitars have never been cheap.
But despite its obvious homage to the Explorer, one feature of the Firebird which would really set it apart from not only Gibson's lineup but most guitars made in this era was its neck through construction. Compare this to the glued sat neck approach Gibson would take on, say, the Les Paul or the SG, it really was rather different. It was more akin to, say, a Rickenbacker 4001 bass. It essentially meant that you had one continuous piece of laminated mahogany and walnut running the entire length of the guitar from the headstock down to the bottom strap pin, with then two pieces of mahogany, the wings, if you want, being glued on either side, of course leaving that raised centre section, which for me at least very much seems indicative of its designer's coach building heritage. However, arguably the real magic of the Firebird can be found in its pickups. Consistently confused with Mini Humbuckers, Mini Humbuckers of course having been an Epiphone design originally that would become largely associated with the Les Paul Deluxe in later years, Firebird pickups by comparison are exactly that, Firebird pickups. Mini Humbuckers use a single bar magnet that sits below and between the coils. The magnet touches each of these posts and creates an opposite magnetic field, giving that humbucking effect, but by comparison, a Firebird pickup uses two rail-style magnets, one each in the centre of the bobbin, around which the coils are wound, yielding a very different magnetic field. And because fewer wires can be put around the rails, they also traditionally have a lower output, meaning that they tend to sound much brighter. In much the same way as those original PAF humbucking pickups that Gibson introduced in 1957, Firebird pickups are not wax potted, leading to the reputation that at high levels of gain, or indeed high volume, they can become a little bit squealy. Now I'd be remiss of me at this point talking about Firebird pickups, not to mention arguably the most famous Firebird pickup, which somewhat ironically resides in a Les Paul. Specifically, Neil Young's Old Black, his 1953 Les Paul. So the story goes that whilst out on tour, the original the original bridge P90 in that guitar died a death and the closest thing that they could approximate to a replacement whilst out on the road was a Firebird pickup and thus the rest is history. Now to highlight the differences between Firebird pickups, mini humbuckers and PAF humbuckers, I'm going to do a quick comparison. Using this 1965 Firebird very kindly on loan for today's video from my good mate Ed against a 1971 Les Paul Deluxe that I borrowed from Vintage and Ray Guitars in Bath in the UK last year, as well as my Panucci Gold Top with more typical humbucking pickups. Now apologies, the clips were recorded the better part of a year apart, so if there are any discrepancies in the playing that may account for it, but crucially, I did use exactly the same recording setup and match the gain levels, and even more importantly, don the same jumper, which I hope would go some way towards matching the tone. This is how they sound. <laughs> Now it's also worth pointing out that today's example of a Firebird is something of an unusual one, dating to very early 1965, but crucially with all 1964 specs. Well, nearly. 
Famously, in 1965, the Gibson Firebird changed design from the more classic reverse to non-reverse. Now, the reason for this change has been highly speculated over the years, with one of the more prevalent theories being Gibson actually being under threat of lawsuit from Fender over the similarities between the body shape of the Firebird and the Jazzmaster and the Jaguar. Now, as much as Fender clearly weren't pleased by any similarities in body shape, the likelihood of an actual lawsuit has probably been exaggerated over the years, and it seems infinitely more likely that the change in design more likely came down to the construction and time spent assembling a neck through guitar, severely hampering its profitability. Whatever the true reason, in 1965, the body design was near enough flipped to a mirror image along with the headstock, ironically putting it much more in line with that of a Stratocaster, but we won't mention that, as well as the construction of the guitar being changed to much more in line with that of a Gibson SG. But a few guitars did escape the factory with a somewhat unique amalgamation of features, as with today's example. Reverse traditional body, but with a non-reverse headstock. Really is an unusual one. I think it's probably fair to say that the new non-reverse design didn't really resonate in the way that Gibson had anticipated because in 1969, only four years after the marked change, the Firebird would disappear from Gibson's catalogue altogether, with the original reverse design continuing to find favour with any number of incredibly high-profile players over the years. Keith Richards, Brian Jones, Eric Clapton, of course Alan Collins, Johnny Winter and Phil Manzanera, Howlin' Wolf, Dave Mason, Paul Stanley, Steve Jones, Steve Clark, Tom Petty, Mike Campbell, Sonny Landreth and of course more recently Dave Grohl have all put the Firebird to incredible use over the years. Now, somewhat sacrilegiously, my love or intrigue in Firebirds has been reignited recently not by a Firebird but by a Firehawk. A guitar that makes zero bones about its inspiration, but is lovingly handmade by Michael Springer in France. And Michael was kind enough to bring along a Firehawk to our Cardinal Black's recent show in Luxembourg late last year, and safe to say I've fallen in love with it. It is a beautiful guitar that plays and sounds absolutely incredible. I'm excited to take it back out on tour next month. All the tour dates down below if you want to check them out. I'm going to play you out now on that guitar, but as ever, thank you very much for watching. Please tune in next week, that subscribe button and the bell icon if you haven't already. And let's just see you next week for another episode of Friday Fry Works. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon.